We are the ISARCA South Africa chapter. We are proud to be connected to the global ISARCA network and with over 2,400 members in South Africa, we are passionate and we love what we do. We are excited to announce that we have another extraordinary conference coming your way in 2020. Let's think digital together. Thinking digital. The ISARCA South Africa 2020 annual conference. You're waiting for. Get your ticket today. Thinking digital. Very excited and I want to learn in this conference. There are emerging technologies. Building communities. Industry experts. Valuable information. Very excited. Register today. We hope to see you there. Hi, good afternoon and welcome everybody. My name is Etienne, Etienne Chartlow. I am CEO of Symphonize Consulting. Um, we're basically a small um, consulting and training organization, um, training in some ISACA products, particularly COVID-5 and COVID-2019 Bridge. And um, I spend a lot of time in the classroom doing lots of training. I was in class training online all day today. So if I lose my voice, <laughs> that is why. Um, so a little bit about my background. I've been working in the IT space for the last 20, 25 years. And the last 15 of those in the IT service management and governance space. And I specialize in governance of IT um, and one of my favorite frameworks is the COVID framework, which is kind of my kind of link with Isaka. And what I chose to speak to everyone uh, about today is something that is kind of front of mind for many people, and that is business continuity. And, you know, when we think about business continuity, we often think about disaster recovery and how do we continue business in the event of a, a catastrophic kind of flood or a fire or a, you know, um, a, a major hacking incident or some kind of major security breach? And now suddenly we're facing something completely different and our backups aren't helping us. And we've realized very quickly that um, business continuity, even if we knew it in theory, we've realized very quickly that business continuity is so much more than just IT disaster recovery. And so our backups aren't helping us deal with uh, the coronavirus outbreak. And so we are having to kind of find new ways of working. And many organizations have done fairly well. You know, here we are with a live online webinar and we're able to take what would normally be a chapter meeting and put it out into a virtual space and we can all attend from home and in many ways it's made life easier um, so what I what I decided to speak about is how we go about using business continuity and some of our responses to situations like this to kind of plan and future proof our businesses and so there are lots of lessons that we can learn from business continuity that give us ideas about how to make our businesses better going forward and how we can use opportunities that are identified through business continuity management to help us identify improvement opportunities and opportunities to kind of protect ourselves from you know changes that are likely to impact us going forward so the objectives of this webinar really um, a to help us understand our response to COVID-19 using business continuity management. And then looking at how, and I don't want to dwell on the negative, but you know, what were our lessons that we learned from, you know, from this kind of global pandemic and the resultant lockdowns across the world, the impact that it's having to how we conduct business meetings, how we conduct our, our, our business 
in a global economy that has kind of all but shut down in terms of international travel. We can't meet face to face. How do we respond to this? How have we responded to this? And what are the lessons that we've learned from this? And what can we use out of this to help our businesses not only survive this whole pandemic, survive the economic kind of meltdown uh, that has resulted from this, but also how can we use this to, to make our businesses thrive going forward as we kind of recover from this, from this pandemic. So the pandemic has kind of, it, it's impacted all of us. Um, many of us on a kind of personal level, uh, we haven't been able to travel into work. Uh, for some of us, that's a great thing. You know, um, it's lovely being able to, to work from home in your pajamas, especially when the weather is really cold. And I know in Cape Town, I've just had some really nasty weather the last few days. Uh, the cold weather has kind of, or the, at least the cold has made it to Johannesburg. We, we don't have the, the rain and the storms and the wind that Cape Town experienced, but the cold does hit us and it hits us quite badly. I'm sitting in my office right now feeling particularly chilly. Um, so it has affected us as individuals. Um, many of us are unable to go to work. Many of us don't have the same level of income that we had uh, prior to, prior to the, the pandemic. Um, if you think about the impact um, for government, you know, governments worldwide are trying to balance protecting citizens and protecting the well-being of their, of their citizens, not just their health, but their well-being as well, and finding that balance. And I think our government here in South Africa has had a particularly hard time where our economy has always been under a lot of strain because of the number of people working compared to the number of people who are dependent on government um, for their livelihoods. And so finding a, a kind of balance between protecting our health and protecting our well-being is something that is particularly challenging for governments around the world, but even more so for the South African government. So it is a, it is a big challenge. Um, we also think about organizations um, who are again, trying to um, manage changes in demand for their products or services. So uh, you think about organizations that um, like gym companies and hotels and organizations in the tourism sector and airlines and organizations like that where the demand for their services has dropped to nothing because you know, we cannot use their services during a lockdown and then other organizations that are facing increased demand for their services, career companies, um, essential services providers. Um, you know, we have so many organizations that are kind of overwhelmed by the demand for their products and services now during the lockdown. Um, and it, it's all about kind of being able to respond to these completely unforeseen events. And business continuity is really about trying to use risk management approaches to help us identify these things before they occur, have a plan for dealing with these things when they occur, and getting business kind of back to normal. Um, that's kind of difficult now because we don't know what the new normal is going to be, but we're starting to kind of get a picture of how things are going to be going forward. And I think many of our responses as organizations right now are going to become the new kind of normal in terms of how we do business. Um, we suddenly realized that, you know, we don't have to travel across the country to attend a business meeting. And so I think a lot of things are going to change. And then I mentioned individuals, we've all been uh, negatively affected. You know, some of us are locked down with family that um, are starting to get on our nerves <laughs> and, um, Others are struggling with internet connectivity. We're expected to work from home, but dialing in is problematic and we keep getting locked out of meetings and you know, um, you've gotten your password, but you can't just walk down to the service desk to, to kind of you know, um, get access again. And so there are lots of complications with this new way of working. But what I want to focus on now is what are some of the benefits um, that, and some of the things that we are learning about this new way of um, operating that we can actually use to kind of future-proof and make our businesses better. So the crisis, and I don't want to dwell on it for 
too long, but it has had a massive impact on the economy. And if you look at um, people like Warren Buffett, they often advise that, you know, it's, it's during these times of crisis when everyone is running scared that you need to kind of go against the flow and, and, and spend some time investing and developing and growing. And so that's what I'm trying to do with my business is kind of use the, use the pandemic um, as, a, as a kind of point to kind of reset. So for the first three, four weeks of the, of the lockdown, zero business. And what that did was it gave me a lot of time to focus my energy on, well, what can I do to come out of this thing stronger? So right now things are tough, but I think if we take the right approach and we use a lot of business continuity management ideas, we can actually use this to grow and, and actually come out of this stronger. So the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, has warned that the world faces the biggest economic crisis since the Great Depression, and they are already predicting that this pandemic is going to wipe out global GDP to the equivalent of the total output of Germany and Japan combined. And those are two very productive economies. Not the biggest in the world, but certainly um, large economies. And so the impact globally is going to be quite uh, drastic. So businesses, as I've said, are facing many challenges and they are trying to find the, uh, find a nice balance between protecting the workforce, how do you keep your, your staff healthy, um, and how do you protect them? Um, how do you encourage and, and um, enable people to work from home? But also understand that working from home has mental health consequences. Um, many people who have been locked down for the last three, three and a half, four months are suffering terribly from cabin fever. So mental health is a big issue. Uh, you know, our, our physical well-being, our mental well-being and our financial well-being um, are all being threatened. And so um, many businesses are kind of trying to deal with all of these different aspects of uh, their workforces. And then they tend to be dealing either with an overwhelming demand for their products and services where they are struggling to cope, especially with limited staff resources because of lockdowns and things like that. Um, or dealing with absolutely zero demand for their products and services. And that was, a, that was a position that my business found itself in where a lot of the training and consulting services that I provide, suddenly during lockdown, absolutely zero demand for those services. So very slowly, um, we are building to, um, to more training online and online consulting services and people are starting to get their heads around uh, this type of um, learning activity and attending online training facilities. And, you know, so it's changing, but uh, it's taken, it's taken at least a few weeks um, to kind of get the ball rolling again. But there are some organizations that are thriving. There's a company in the UK, they uh, offer home-based care. Uh, they are called CIRA and they are talking about creating 10,000 new jobs for home carers, and that is that is in the UK, um, where they are using these people to, and creating jobs for people that are going to look after the elderly that have been affected by the coronavirus. And then Amazon announcing 3,000 new jobs in South Africa as they expand their operations here. And these, you know, in a time like this, it's quite incredible that there are organizations that are able to thrive in spite of the conditions. The idea is that as the economy changes, as people get used to new ways of working, as people get used to the idea of not having to travel to meetings, being able to attend meetings remotely, being able to attend training courses from the comfort of their own home, what we're finding is that our stakeholders, our customers, our suppliers, a lot of people have new priorities. Um, we've all had to reprioritize. Um, even even in terms of what we're buying in terms of groceries has changed dramatically and the way we do grocery shopping has changed. So our priorities have changed. I know the way I do grocery shopping now has changed quite considerably from before the lockdown. So now I limit my grocery shopping to kind of one grocery shopping trip every three weeks. 
And so I'm tending to buy goods and services that are going to last longer. Um, so I'm buying less fresh produce and buying stuff that can last longer. Um, so just in terms of our daily living, we've got new priorities. Our stakeholders, our customers, all of these uh, people that our businesses are interacting and, uh, uh, and engaging with have new or changed priorities. As businesses, we've got new and changed priorities. And so as the, as the kind of landscape in which we are operating has changed, so we are having to change and adapt with it. And so it's important that we understand how priorities are changing so that we as businesses can follow suit. So the whole point of this, this webinar today is really to talk about business continuity management, what it is, and how we can get some ideas from our continuity plans that can future-proof our businesses. So I decided to start off just introducing the kind of concept of business continuity management and getting a feel for what it is. Because so many people, especially people who work in the IT space, think that business continuity is IT service continuity. And even worse than that, they often think that it is disaster recovery and having backups. And as I mentioned right at the beginning of the talk, um, having backups hasn't helped us one little bit in this <laughs> coronavirus outbreak. You know, our backups are not doing any good when we can't get our staff into the office or we can't access our customers or we're not allowed to offer services, our existing services and products to our customers. So I decided to start off with the definition of business continuity that comes out of the international standard 22300. Um, this is a product of um, standards in the security and resilience space. And it defines business continuity as the capability that an organization has to continue delivering products and services within acceptable timeframes at predefined capacity during a disruption. And a disruption, really some kind of disaster. And you know, the coronavirus is a disaster, unlike anything we've seen for that people are talking about since, since, the, since the Black Plague you know, 100 years ago. And this diagram that I'm showing you now is a diagram that comes to us from the Business Continuity Institute. And they describe business continuity as being about having a plan for dealing with difficult situations. So it really is about scenario planning so that we can continue to function with as little disruption as possible. And they have this really useful cycle for thinking about um, embedding business continuity in business so that we can respond very quickly when things happen. And so I want to talk you through the, the kind of five steps in the cycle, and then we can start looking at how this helps us future-proof our businesses. So starting off with step one, this is really about analyzing your context, understanding who your stakeholders are, understanding the environment in which you operate, the legal um, environment, the, um, the market spaces that you serve, so understanding your organization's kind of external context, as well as understanding your organization's internal context. That would be things like your organization's culture, um, the values of your organization, your company's vision, your mission, um, your, your kind of working practices, um, the competencies of your staff, internal policies and regulations. So, it's also about understanding your vision, understanding your strategies, understanding your goals, and what is important to your organization. I spoke a little while ago about um, kind of changing priorities, and our businesses have new priorities. In the last three, four months, our priorities have changed. And so it is important that we understand and consider these changed priorities as we build on, our, understand our vision and our strategies, it's also important that we understand our stakeholders, stakeholders, basically anyone affecting our businesses, anyone affected by our businesses. So think suppliers, think um, consultants, think um, customers, think uh, the community in which we operate. So there are a lot of stakeholders that are affected by our businesses or who have an effect on our businesses. 
And so we want to take their needs into consideration as well as part of the first step, which is analyzing and understanding the context in which we are operating. Once we have a proper understanding of who our stakeholders are, what we as an organization value, what our stakeholders value, um, what it is that our organization aims to achieve, what our strategic vision is. Once we understand that fully, then we can then design our business continuity plans. Because ultimately, our business continuity plans are the plans that are going to fall into place when stuff goes wrong. So that we can continue on that journey towards achieving our mission and our vision. And ultimately, that's, that's the end goal, is moving closer to our vision and our mission in spite of the circumstances. So the next step really in designing your business continuity plan is to review your business, understand what its assets are. And remember your business assets are not necessarily just the tangible physical assets, your staff, your infrastructure, your buildings, um, your IT infrastructure, all of that stuff that is physically available and valuable is important, but also think about your company's brand and your company's reputation. Uh, there are a lot of organizations that are taking a lot of flack uh, during the lockdown based on the way they are treating customers. Uh, many organizations are owed money by customers who just cannot pay because they've been furloughed or they aren't working. Many people are being retrenched. And there's a, there's a lot of damage being done to corporate brands by the way these big brands are, are treating individuals and treating their customers during this very difficult time for everyone. So a big part of business continuity is understanding what your assets are. And it's important that we understand that intangible assets like your brand and your reputation are often as valuable as your physical infrastructure and your buildings and your physical valuable assets. So once we have an understanding of what our assets are, we also want to understand how important these assets are to our organizations in achieving their, their business goals and, uh, and, their, and their, their values. So I have an example. One of, my, one of my biggest clients is a large training provider, and they've got massive buildings with lots and lots of classrooms that are completely unusable to them. So right now they are using one floor out of about nine floors that they own. And you know, the other eight floors are just classroom space that, are, that they are unable to use because all of the training has kind of moved online. And I can't see um, them being able to use those classrooms any, in any meaningful way. Um, certainly not in an efficient way anytime soon, um, especially not uh, this year, maybe early next year. Um, but the idea is some of our assets are going to be a lot more important to us than others. And in different scenarios, some of these assets become more important, some of them become less important. Yeah, you know, the example of the classrooms for the training provider, when they're unable to use the classrooms, you know, for the foreseeable future. Um, so once we understand what our assets are, how valuable they are to us in our current working environment, we can then start thinking about what are the things that could go wrong and what can we do, and this is where risk management plays an important part, what can we do to minimize disruption? So ideally what we wanna do is try to prevent as many of these risks as we possibly can from occurring. So if we can prevent the risk, great. If we can't prevent it, how do we reduce the impact if it does happen? And that's really what business continuity management is about. It's about understanding these, these things that are often unforeseen so risk management tries to help us predict stuff that might happen. But what we also want to do, and this is where business continuity comes into play, is have a, a planned response to stuff that we cannot foresee. And I think the, you know, the, the current epidemic is something that, although we've had some warnings, you, know, you, look, at, um, you look at SARS, you look at MERS, um, you look at some of the swine flus. We've had some warnings, but we've never imagined a pandemic on this kind of level before. So, so this is certainly 
a, a good example of a, an unforeseen circumstance. So what we want to do is try to develop strategies that are going to help us minimize the disruption of stuff that we can't foresee and plan responses to different scenarios. Um, and some scenarios are completely unlike others. You know, um, you, can, you can plan for what happens if your building burns down or what happens if your canteen accidentally poisons half your staff um, and everyone ends up in hospital for a week with food poisoning. How do you continue business in a situation like that? And so what we want to do is plan responses. And what's interesting is if you look at some of the guidance in terms of business continuity, doing nothing, having a kind of wait and see approach for some incidents is actually a, a perfectly acceptable response. So if you can wait and see what's going to happen before you respond, sometimes that is actually a good way to, to respond. But the idea is that we want to design our plans and then implement our plans. So we want to have plans that are implementable. So when stuff happens, we can carry out that plan and learn from those plans to improve those plans for future incidents. So the plan is going to help us consider how we respond. As a result of putting these plans together, some of these plans we are going to be able to use. Hopefully we never have to use them. Our business continuity is a little bit like insurance. It's something that we feel we have to have um, and it's a good idea to have it just in case. But if it never happens, we're actually glad that it doesn't happen. You know, uh, uh, it's a little bit like insurance. We hate paying insurance every month, but we're very grateful that we have it when something goes wrong. Business continuity is a little bit like that. But the idea is that we, uh, and one of, the, one of the things with business continuity is we want, to, we want to have business continuity plans for lots of little things as well as big things. And if you can have continuity plans in place for small, smaller things, what that does is it helps your organization build up resilience. So as a result of this global pandemic, your response might be a combination of a whole load of your little response plans to other things that can actually kick in and make your business more resilient. Um, Step four validation is also about auditing, measuring, getting feedback on your plans to make sure that they're effective, that you've got plans in place that protect many of your assets, protect many of your strategies and your, your, your ability to, to work closer and work towards uh, your organization's vision. And then when you've got your plans in place, you really want to make sure that business continuity is something that is embedded in your organization. So anytime we update or change a significant part of a business process, we want to think about, well, what is this change to this business process? What impact is that change going to have on our business continuity plans? Do we need to update our plans to reflect this new business process? We've maybe taken on a, a new product. We've developed a or we've got a new customer. How do we make sure that we embed that into our business continuity plans? And how do we continually adapt and improve our business continuity plans to, uh, as informed by our changing business? As business these days is changing faster than any other, other point in history. And in the last three months, um, change has been pretty drastic. So um, it's important that we embed these changes that we're making to business practices in our business continuity approach. All right. So one of the things that I do want to stress in this webinar is that there is always hope. You know, as many of our businesses be, have been badly impacted and many of us are kind of restarting and rebuilding almost from scratch, we can fix things. You know, if you've still got a business, you know, build on what you've, what you've currently got. Use business continuity management, use the lessons that you've learned out of this virus and this pandemic to kind of grow and move forward. So many of us weren't expecting this level uh, of, a, of, a, of an international disaster. Um, and for many businesses, you know, it, it has hit us really, really badly. Uh, and even if you are building from your ruins, you know, you're starting from a place of knowledge and knowledge is power. I know that's, a, that's such a cliche, but 
learn from the lessons that we've taken out of this. You know, I learned very quickly that my business was far too dependent on a very small number of, of clients who all have very similar business models. And when one of their business models failed, they all failed. And as a result, my business model failed. So what we really want to do is try to ensure that the lessons that we've learned, we take forward and they make us more powerful going forward. So it is very easy to become overwhelmed. It is very easy to feel threatened by the situation that we currently find ourselves in. So my advice really is focus on the little things. As I said uh, a few slides ago, with business continuity management, it's all very well focusing on the big disasters that might impact us. But if we build resilience and responses and business continuity management responses into small processes, small parts of our businesses, and we get the little things right, those quick wins can help us feel more motivated, help us take these things in our stride. If you had lots of small responses to other disasters in the past, even if they weren't as, as great or didn't have as much of an impact as this one, you can actually learn from those small little responses, what worked, what didn't work, and you can take those things and, you know, so maybe, I don't know, maybe there was a, maybe there was an infestation at your building and you decided to, to fumigate and you had to postpone a meeting or immediately just move a meeting online. The lessons that you learned from that small meeting and moving that online is something that we can use now going forward into this. Lessons we've learned about providing training and consulting services online can help us go forward. So I very quickly learned that I don't have to worry about the expense of finding a venue, booking catering, all of these things um, to offer a training course. I can now offer training online and save all of those expenses. It, it makes it easier for um, my customers. They don't have to travel into, to, into my premises. No one has to fight with Joburg or Cape Town traffic to attend a training course anymore. We don't have to fly people across the country to attend a training course. So actually what's happening is a lot of the things that we are using to respond to this pandemic are actually going to make our businesses more effective, more efficient going forward. And that's the whole point. I want to kind of use this webinar to, to give hope. Let's see what we can do to use the ideas from business continuity to give us new ways of working and, and just to kind of look on the, on the bright side um, and to take these lessons and, and turn what we can out of this pandemic into into a positive initiative. So your response to business continuity can lead to new opportunities. So responses like being able to work online, having remote meetings, using offsite recovery facilities, moving your services into a cloud so your staff can access them from anywhere and you don't have to necessarily rely on physical spaces. You know, um, all of these things, all of these things that we would normally do in response to a disaster or some unforeseen event, you know, maybe if your building burns down and you rent temporary office space, you might realize that actually renting office space might be more feasible. Sharing office space might be more feasible because if you're renting or sharing office space, as demand increases, you can rent more offices. As business shrinks or you need less space, you can rent less offices. And a lot of our responses to disaster can teach us lessons for making our businesses more effective and more efficient going forward. Um, our responses like renting office space, moving stuff into the cloud, makes our businesses and our business processes more scalable. We can grow and shrink our businesses as necessary. We don't have to waste resources like having you know, a massive building full of classrooms that you just can't use. So leasing temporary space, again, it, it, it gives your business flexibility, it gives your business scalability. Moving business applications into the cloud, 
so that people can work during this virus might be a better way of running your business going forward. You know, if you don't have to have as much office space going forward, if people can work from home, if people are comfortable working from home, you know, do we really need going forward to actually have as, as much office space as we've had in the past? Maybe that office space can be better used by society. So moving our business applications into the cloud, working from home, renting office space rather than buying office space. All of these things might change the way we work going into the future. And I know that I come from an IT background. I'm a little bit biased towards IT solutions, but technology is our friend. And if you think about things like cloud, cloud has been around as an idea since the 70s, but it's only really become feasible as internet speeds, bandwidth has increased and, and made cloud practical. So you know, where you can run things in the cloud, where you can, can use cloud-based services. And if you look at cloud, um, it has made platforms available as a service, infrastructure as a service, software as a service. All of these as a service technologies give us such amazing ability to scale and we can scale back and scale forward as, as much as we need. When we need to grow, we phone our service provider and say, hey, we need an extra server. And they type in a line of code and away we go. We've got an extra server, we've got extra capacity. So capacity management, um, meeting changes in demand, all of this stuff is made easier using technology. And a lot of the lessons that we're getting out of our response to the COVID-19 pandemic is helping us understand that a lot of the stuff that we were scared of before, like remote meetings, attending online training, attending online webinars, all of these things that we didn't want to do because it felt uncomfortable and I don't like being on camera. That was my big thing. I don't like being on camera. I hate, I hate being on camera. I hate watching myself on video. So one of the things I've learned very quickly about doing online webinars is it's live. If I mess up, Hey, tough. There's nothing I can do about it. I can't go back and edit it or fix it. If I mess up, I mess up. I move on. And because I can't see myself, and I always make sure that I can't see um, myself on camera, it just makes it so much easier for me. So I can talk to you like I am now. I can't see myself, so I'm quite comfortable. I'm talking to a little white dot on my screen. It's, it's great, you know. Um, so the whole point I'm making is that all of these things that we were scared of, remote meetings, remote working, um, uh, you know, trusting our staff to work from home, all of this stuff is something that um, we were scared of in the past. Managers didn't know how they were going to manage their staff. How do you, how do you control your staff if you can't see them? How do you make sure they're working? Well, you measure them on the right stuff. If you've got the right metrics, if you've got the right performance measures in place, does it matter whether they spend 10 or 12 hours doing it or whether they completed or achieved their objectives in four hours? You know, obviously, if you're in a customer service environment and you need to be available for eight hours for your customers, you know, it's important that you're available. But if you've got the right measures in place, you don't have to micromanage or oversee your staff and, and kind of check on them every minute. You know? So a lot of managers are learning from this and from, business, from their business continuity responses that it's okay to empower your staff to, to let people get on with stuff. If you're measuring them on the right metrics, if you've got the right measures in place, if you're monitoring the right stuff, how people achieve those goals is not that important. Um, augmented and virtual reality. We can now demonstrate and prototype stuff. We can model things and demonstrate products before we build them. Saving cost. Um, we're not investing so much in physical products um, before we've tested them. Machine learning, AI, digital transformation, all of these new technologies or, or ideas that have been around that are becoming more practical now, they're all helping us do business better. And for many of us, we see these things as ways of responding to disasters, but why not see these things as ways of moving forward and 
protecting ourselves from future disasters. So technology really can be your friend. It can protect your data, it can protect your information. You know, um, um, data and information controls. Um, you know, as much as working online and opens us up to cyber attacks and there are cyber security risks, um, a lot of these risks help us identify security threats and help us respond more quickly to and protect ourselves better. So technology actually helps us protect our data and our information better. So as much as it opens us up to risk, it also gives us a lot of control. It gives us scalability, as I've spoken about already. It helps us adapt to trends. It helps us streamline operations. It helps us cut out waste. So think about Lean and, and Six Sigma and, and, and concepts like that, and how our responses to this have fought out of waste. A lot of wasted travel, for example. Yeah, uh, fostering interaction, good customer experience, technology can actually help you interact and engage more. If you're not stuck in traffic for two hours a day, you've got more time to talk to people. You've got more time to interact with customers, to understand the needs of your organization's stakeholders. Um, assisting with strategic innovation and believe it or not, making employees happy. You know, technology can make a difference. You know, how many people here really enjoy sitting in traffic for two hours a day? You know, one of the things I love about living in Johannesburg is being able to use the Gau train. And the reason I love it is because it gives me time to read. When I'm stuck in traffic in a car, I don't have time to read. The amount of reading I've done since lockdown, because I don't have to travel every day, it, it really has it's changed my life. You know, whereas I would maybe read a book every one or two months, I'm now finishing a book in a week. And that's purely because I've got less time in traffic and I can do more. So technology can, can make people happier. All right, so key activities for future-proofing your business. Recognize that the world is changing faster than at any point in history and that we need to respond. Yes, things are upside down right now, the world is not going to go back to the way it was. If we understand that and we accept that the pandemic has lit fires under people and forced us to adopt business strategies that we were scared of in the past, all of these things are good things. So my advice, learn from your mistakes. And we've all made mistakes in this crisis. It's okay to make mistakes when you're under pressure. Understand your brand. Focus on what matters to you and your brand. Focus on what matters to your customers. Identify your risks. Identify what your customers want. Adopt these new technologies to make business better. Small steps. Don't try and do too much. Do what you can in the moment and learn after every step. So get feedback after every step. Um, you know, many of us don't like auditors, and I probably shouldn't say that in a, in a soccer webinar. But the idea is that auditors are your friends too. You know, get your auditors involved in giving you feedback, telling you what's working, what's not working, what's opening you up to to risk. You know, where where are the holes in in your response? So, my advice is use these people. Does anyone have any questions? Don't all shout at once. <laughs> okay, so I did. Um, hi, um, Etienne. Thank you so much for that informative um, webinar. Um, I did post in the group, so we're just going to give them a couple of minutes. But um, if there's no responses, um, it's okay. We have a hand up here. I'm just going to ask to unmute you if you um, don't mind asking it over your mic. Hi, Etienne. Thanks for the presentation. It was very informative. I think for me, I'm an auditor and the problems that I experience is that it's very difficult to sell BCM to be done or to be or documented in an organization. So what do you think would be the ways to actually 
get them to do it. Or sometimes it just feels like it's such a tedious process to be done. Uh, and yeah. then it's very really difficult to sell for organizations to invest in it and have it maintained and have it up to date, those kind of things. So, yeah, what's your it, advice? It, it is a difficult sell. I, I know that it's a difficult sell. So as a consultant, I do a lot of kind of consulting in the, I, I do a lot of consulting and helping particularly public sector organizations implementing the DPSAs, CGIC, TPF. And one of the requirements of that policy framework is that they have an IT service continuity management policy and plan that conforms to their business continuity plan, but the organization has no business continuity in place. And many organizations don't like business continuity just as they don't like risk management because people don't want to think about negative stuff. Yeah. Um, thinking about what might be and what might go wrong is scary. So I think that's one of the reasons why a lot of organizations kind of avoid business continuity management. But I think a crisis like the one that we're going through now is a great opportunity for individuals like ourselves to say to people, well, you know, one of the biggest lessons we've learned from this is that IT disaster recovery is not enough. We need to start thinking about how do, we, how do we protect our business going forward from stuff that we don't know could happen? And I think that's one of the, one of the big benefits. Um, and it's terrible to think about a pandemic like this as having benefits. But, you know, if we don't look at the bright side, you know, then, then we're all, all going to get very miserable. So my advice is let's take this and use this as a selling point for business continuity and say, well, if we'd thought about business continuity in the past, we would have been able to handle this crisis so much better. So I think business continuity is going to be an easier sell going forward. I don't know if that helps or that answers your question. Um, is there any other additional questions or anybody raising their hands? If not, thank you so much, Etienne. We really appreciate that you took the time out to um, come speak to us about something so important. And um, then I would just like to inform everybody that we look so, um, we were so excited um, for our next presenter, which is Nolan Nadesan, who will, presenting, uh, who will be presenting on the 8th of July on Poppy, Where to Begin, Time, to be confirmed, we are trying to figure out um, what time suits our members best. So please let us know at info at isaka.org.za if you prefer the 10 a.m. webinars or if you will prefer the 4 p.m. webinars. We do try, we're trying to figure out um, if the afternoons or the mornings will work better. So we are open to suggestions. Please let us know. Um, on that note, do um, enjoy your afternoon and have a lovely day further. And I thank you from my side too. Thank you so much, Etienne.